We are going to get into week eight of this series, Collide, and this is kind of a milestone. We've been looking, going through the book of Acts since the beginning of last year. This is the 50th message in the book of Acts so far, and there's probably 25 maybe left to go, so we're, we're getting there, you know. The end is almost in sight. We'll be done late in the fall. I'm hoping by early October we're done with uh, Acts Uh, That's kind of what we're trekking on right now. But we're in week eight of this specific series, and we're going to see the same thing that we've seen over and over and over again in this book of Acts, is that these followers of Jesus in the Bible cannot stay out of trouble. It seems like they're doing great things, they're doing positive work, they're making positive change, and they just keep finding themselves in difficult spots, in a lot of trouble. It's the same thing here with Paul and Silas and their team as they're in Thessalonica in Greece. We started there last week, and they did some good things. They, they went into the synagogue, and they reasoned with the people. We mentioned it last week, and they explained how Jesus is in all of the scriptures there, and then people believed. They proved it. People put their faith in Jesus, like men and women, Jew and Gentile, put their faith in Jesus. And you would think, that's good. That's great. That's positive. At worst, that's neutral, Right? But not so much, right? Not so fast, my friends, okay? Because what we find quickly is that Paul and Silas become under pressure. After this time where they've been ministering in the synagogues and preaching to people and sharing Christ with them and people's lives are changed and transformed by the gospel, they find themselves now under pressure. So that's what we're going to look at today. Let's continue in Acts 17. We're just going to read verses 5 through 9 and look at how much under pressure not only Paul and Silas, but even other people around them become, okay? This is Acts 17, verse 5. It says, but some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas, so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted, and now they are here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. The people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond, and then they released them. So Paul and Silas and poor old Jason that we'll talk about in a little bit, they find themselves under pressure. What we'll look at in this short text here, there are three main charges brought against Paul, Silas, Timothy, the other Luke, and then Jason and the other believers. There are three main charges brought against them. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine the charges and really see how they apply even to us today as well. As we maybe sometimes find ourselves as followers of Jesus under similar pressure. And we'll talk about that here today. So we'll examine these three charges. The first of which is they're accused of making trouble. That's initially what the mob, what this group says. These guys are making trouble. They've made trouble over here and over there, and now they've come here to make more trouble. That's the first accusation made against them. And again, what have they done? They've gone to the synagogue and talked about Jesus in a reasonable way. We looked at it last week. They reasoned with the people. They talked, question and answer session. Very. They didn't stir up any trouble, but they're accused of stirring up trouble here. And what you can tell from from what happened and the accusation made and the mob that forms is this pressure is manufactured. This mob is created by these powerful elites. And Luke tells us the motivation. He tells us why. It was jealousy. The same thing that Peter dealt with earlier in Acts. The religious leaders of that town have things under control, and they're in control. And so now this outsider comes into town and starts messing up our system. He threatens our power and our stronghold over the people, over the religion, over the worship, and they're accused then of causing trouble. They incite a mob into a frenzy. They've made trouble elsewhere. Now they're going to make it here. That's the claim. And this is what happens when followers of Jesus make a strong stand for the gospel because it threatens the status quo of the culture. The gospel does that. The gospel threatens existing power structures. 
The gospel exposes the futility of those in power, that Jesus is greater. So if, here, here's, here's what I would say, and this, I don't want to start anything, but here's the thing. If we as Christians are going to similarly be accused of causing trouble, then let's cause some trouble, shall we? And I want to be specific about that. I'm not, uh, please don't. <laughs> the date, it's, it's June 2nd, not January 6th, okay? So I, that's not what's happening here, okay? I just had to get that in there, right? But here's what I mean by that. Al Mohler, commentary on Acts, he says this, when Christians try to blend into the flow of the culture rather than turn it upside down with the gospel, they no longer practice faithfulness. So the kind of trouble that I'm saying we should start is simply telling people there's a better way to live life than the way you're living it. There's a better way to govern yourself than the way the culture tells you is the best way. And his name is Jesus. And think about it. It seems very simple. Our culture, our world is always stressed out. But Jesus offers rest. He says, come to me if you labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You can have stress or you can have rest, right? The culture and then the media amp it up with fear mongering, okay? But Jesus offers peace. It's different. The culture is obsessed with status and acceptance, but Jesus, a relationship with him, makes you a child of God. What better status could there be than that? What more acceptance could the human heart long for than that? But it upsets the cultural norms. It upsets what is accepted by the broader culture. Our culture is obsessed with self and happiness, and yet they're always miserable. You find that really odd? People are obsessed with self and happiness, yet because we never find it, we're always miserable. But Jesus helps us to focus on others, and in that pursuit, we find joy. It's amazing, but it upsets the status quo. Our culture constantly searches for meaning, but Jesus gives us ultimate meaning. It's the choice that people have. And so here's, here's, again, the weird thing, is that Christians are typically in this kind of setting, even in the culture of the day in which we live, are accused of being the disruptors. And yet we're the ones that are trying to promote order. No, Jesus offers a different way, a better way, a way of peace, a way of true love, a way of harmony that actually works. But yet the culture is turned upside down. They accuse Christians of trying to turn everything upside down. It's like, no, 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 no. We're trying to turn everything right side up through the power of the gospel. But it upsets the norms and the cultural order of the day. And so even though the world is in trouble, followers of Jesus, and maybe you've been in this boat even recently, will be accused of being troublemakers. It's weird. But if loving and following and sharing about Jesus makes me a troublemaker, then I would say guilty as charged. Because that's the option that I choose. That's the lane that I'm going to stay in. That's, that's what I'm giving, giving my life to. And so if we're going to be accused of making trouble, then in this particular way that we've just outlined, let's make that kind of trouble. Okay? The second accusation of Paul and Silas and the other believers here is treason. And this really gets, I think, more even to the core of the problem with the leaders in power. Because the Christians here, Paul, Silas, the, their team, uh, are seen to be not just upsetting the cultural order, but to be shaking up the political power structure of their day. And that's really what gets them into trouble. Those in power put political pressure on Paul and Silas to stop what they're doing to get out of town. They, they incite this mob, they manufacture the mob to try to pull them out into the town square, and who knows what's going to happen. Luckily, they weren't around to be caught, and then the authorities took it from there. They accuse them of treason. They say they worship another king named Jesus. Now, Jesus, in his life and ministry, he never really technically claimed to be a king, but when asked about it, he also didn't deny that he was a king. So when he's on trial before the Roman governor Pilate, See, so he did, he did make claims to be the Messiah of the Jewish people, which Messiah just means anointed one or chosen one. It doesn't mean king necessarily. However, many of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah have the king element in there. 
talks about one that will reign on David's throne. He will reign forever and ever. So there is an element to that. So when Jesus makes the claim he's the Messiah, the people don't like that. The religious elites don't like the threat to their power that Jesus promotes. And so they accuse him of blasphemy. The problem is they don't have the authority to execute Jesus at the time that they want to. And when they take him to the Roman authorities for execution, the Romans don't care if he blasphemes any god. They don't care about that. They don't care anything about the Jewish religion at all. As long as you just stay quiet and don't disrupt the peace, you can do whatever you want. You can worship in your temple. You can make your sacrifices. We don't care. And so they can't say, well, he's a blasphemer against the Jews. Kill him, Rome. They don't care. So they take the king part of the Messiah and say he's claiming to be the king of the Jews. Now that is a problem for the Roman Empire because only Caesar is king. Right? He, there's no, if there's a threat to him, we will take care of that. So he's brought before Pilate, and here's some of the questioning of, of Pilate to Jesus in John chapter 18, starting at verse number 33. It says, Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought into him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, Is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king? Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. So Jesus, in classic Jesus fashion, is very clever. He doesn't directly answer Pilate's question or accusation against him at all. He says, well, that's what you say. Are you asking me if I'm the king? You know, it's what he never answers the question. Yet he also doesn't deny that he is, in fact, a king. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. So basically what Jesus is saying here is my kingdom is not just limited to the Jewish people. I'm not just the king of the Jews. The threat that I pose as a king is not limited to the Roman Empire in the first century. He says my kingdom is over the entire universe. There's no limit to my reign. There's no borders to my kingdom. It's over everything. So there was, this was the, and this was the main threat here, as we saw in Acts 17. That fact that Jesus is king over everything is a huge threat to the current existing power structure in the culture. Because there was a common saying in the first century, second century, in the Roman Empire, you, a, a common greeting would be, Caesar is Lord. You're, you're giving your allegiance to Caesar, who's not only a human leader, but he is God, sort of like the ancient pharaohs would have been. Caesar is Lord. And so the ancient Christians commandeered that phrase, and they would say, Jesus is Lord. That's a threat to the power structure, but it's absolutely accurate to explain who Jesus is. So unlike the first accusation that they're troublemakers, which you you kind of have to stretch that, this accusation in Acts 17 that there is no king but Jesus is absolutely accurate. They're like, yeah, you're, you got that exactly right. We believe there is no king besides Jesus. There is no one above him. And later on when John has this revelation of Jesus, he has this final vision of Jesus, his victorious return at the end of days. And he's got this white robe and he's got this sword in his hand. And he's wearing crowns on all the crowns. Not- plural. I looked it up to make sure crowns on his head because he's king of kings. We'll see in a second. And he's, he's coming victorious to really end everything. Every threat against his kingdom, he's come to end that. And here's how John describes this vision of Jesus. Revelation 19, 16. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, king of all kings and lord of all lords. And Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, here's how he describes the kingship and the lordship of Jesus. He says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a problem here, though. You look at these last two verses that we just looked at, the powerful king, the conquering king, king of kings, you know, undefeated. 
But then you juxtapose that with this meek, mild, traveling preacher in front of this powerful Roman governor who then is later crucified. That doesn't seem to go together. There's a disconnect here between one picture of this king and another picture of this king. So what gives? If Jesus is king of all kings, and if he's all-powerful, and everyone will one day bow to him, then why go through the humiliation and torture of the cross? It's because Jesus is the best kind of king. He's the kind of king that loves his people and serves his people. You know, some kings and even some non-king leaders are just little tyrants. You know, they're, they're children trapped in an adult's body because they want you to know how powerful they are. They, they sometimes want to crush you with their power just so there's no mistaking who's in charge here. Maybe you work for somebody like that. No, don't, you know, okay, maybe you're married to some, no, 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 you know, your spouse would never act like a little tyrant, would they? They wouldn't do that. But some leaders are oppressive in that way. They're little tyrants, and they're power hungry, they're insecure, and they want you to know how powerful they are at all times. They will crush you under the weight of their power. And the people will fear that leader, but they will hate them. They will serve that leader because they have no option, but they will do it through gritted teeth and with the worst attitude ever. They will do it because they're forced to, but Jesus is not that way. He's the best kind of king. He's benevolent to his people. He gives and serves and loves his people. And that is why he's worth worshiping as your king. Here's one way it's described. Warren Wiersbe, in his book, Be Daring, he says this, The kingship of Jesus Christ is unlike that of the rulers of this world. He conquers with ambassadors, not armies, and his weapons are truth and love. He brings men peace by upsetting the peace and turning things upside down. We see that theme yet again. He conquers through his cross where he died for a world of lost sinners. He even died for his enemies. The truth is the entire 33 years of the life of Jesus is basically an undercover rescue mission. That's what it is. Because Jesus is already enthroned in heaven before he ever comes to earth. He's already worshipped by angels as God the Son. But to serve his people, he willingly left that glory to live as a created being, to take the punishment of his created beings to reconnect them back to God when they had made the disconnect. And now he's back on his rightful throne in heaven. That's why Jesus is worshiping as king. And honestly, who would reject that kind of king? Who's going to reject a king that would give up everything to love and serve and give to his people? And yet so many do. What's even crazier is that the people, like back to Acts 17, the people who reject the rightful king of the universe accuse those who worship the king of the universe as treasonous. Everything is backwards without Jesus. Everything is, is totally backward without him. But let me ask you this. Let me push us and challenge us just a little bit this morning. Are you guilty of treason? And by that, I mean, is Jesus truly king of your life? Is he number one? Is he supreme? Is he first above everything and everyone? Is he king above your comfort, above your convenience, above your status, above your possessions, above your popularity, above any other thing in your life? And if not, what is that thing that you're holding back? And will you choose to, in the words of Frozen, let it go? Sorry to make a, non, a serious thing not serious for a second, but I just can't help myself. I can't hold it back anymore, okay? Um, is Jesus number one? Is he truly king? Is he number one in your heart? That's a question to wrestle with. And if you say yes, or as I'm sure many of us are, if your desire is to more and more and more say yes to that question, let me ask you another question. Are you prepared for the pressure that that will bring to your life? Putting Jesus first will bring pressure to your life. People will not always understand that decision. People will always judge putting Jesus 
first. They're always going to try to poke holes in that logic. They're going to see you as simple-minded or stupid or closed-minded or bigoted or backward or judgmental or weak. Are you prepared for the blowback, for the pressure that seriously putting Jesus, number one, as king in your life may cause? But I, I, as I said with the first point, if this messed up, confused, lost culture wants to accuse me of treason, again, guilty as charged. I'm choosing as best I can each and every day to put Jesus number one, to acknowledge he is king of kings and lord of lords, which means he's king of my heart. He's king of my life. He's king of my mind. He's king of my decisions. He's king over my family. He's king over everything, every desire I have. My effort, my goal, hopefully your effort, your goal is to put him number one as king of the universe, to be guilty of treason. Here's the last accusation that uh, is made against the Christians here in Thessalonica, and that is that they're, they're just on the wrong team. They're on the wrong team. Really, it's, the accusation is, is guilt by association. And really, this is made against not Paul and Silas directly. It's made by a poor guy named Jason who has nothing to do with anything as far as we know. We don't even know if he's a believer in Jesus. The accusation made against him is that he's been housing Paul and Silas, but there's no evidence to prove that he is. Maybe he was, but there's no evidence to prove that. They go in and look for them in Jason's home, can't find him, can't find them anywhere, can't find any evidence they've ever been in his home, yet he's guilt by association. So they drag him and other people out into the town square in this mob. Well, we can't find the first two guys we want. You'll do. That's kind of their attitude here with Jason and these other believers. And the mob comes against them. They're arrested, and they have to actually post bond to be released from jail. So, and apparently this type of behavior continued on in Thessalonica months and years later. When Paul writes back to this church, he says this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. He says, and then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's church in Judea, who because of their belief in Christ Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. It's true, but how sad is that? that friends and neighbors and even family members would persecute fellow friends, neighbors, and family members simply for their faith in Jesus. It's sad but true. It's one thing for the corrupt government system or the power structure to do that. It's another thing when neighbor rats out neighbor. It's another thing when family rejects family because of faith, but it happens, and maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now where someone that you love so deeply will not speak to you anymore because you put Jesus first. Maybe you're there because you've made a stand on this issue that the Bible is clear about, and the friend that you would die for will not pick up the phone for you. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've had parent or child or sibling or BFF of all time turn their back on you simply because you've made a stand for Jesus. It's sad, but it's true, and it's all too common and becoming increasingly a problem in our day of polarization. Jesus, however, said this would happen. So whether it's unfortunate or fortunate, he kind of gave us a heads up. In Matthew chapter 10, here's what Jesus says. He says, a brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child, and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. Skip down to verse 34 of Matthew 10. Don't imagine, Jesus says, that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. Now, clarification on that last part, Jesus is not saying that he intends to bring division himself, but he knows indirectly he will. And what he's doing at the end there in, in verse 34 and, or 35 and 36, he's quoting the Old Testament prophet Micah. Micah chapter 7 quotes that last section there in Matthew 10. And it's talking about the evil in the land will bring division, but judgment will come for them and the righteous will look to the Lord for help. 
So again, just understand, Jesus is not saying, I'm go- I want to bring division. He's saying, I just know inevitably my message is not going to jive with everyone. And for those who do buy into what I'm saying, it's going to sometimes cause a problem relationally with you in severe ways. Paul warns of what Paul experiences here, what the other believers experience, and maybe, unfortunately, what you have and maybe are experiencing right now. It's part of this tragic, painful part of following Jesus. However, I want to give you some good news on that. When it comes to this team, Jesus makes a promise to those even who are facing that difficult situation in your life relationally. Mark chapter 10, he says this, verse 29 and 30, Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So Jesus does warn of possible rejection for making him king. You're a troublemaker. I can't associate with you anymore. You're on the wrong team. I'm going to cut you off, cut you out. It's going to happen. But he says that even through that loss or after that loss, you will have a new team. You will have a new support system. You will not be left on your own. You will have your own new family. That's the church. The church, if your family has deserted you and left you and abandoned you and forsaken you for the sake of the gospel, this is your family. If your friends have said, I'm done with you, I can't be associated with that low-minded kind of thinking, that knuckle-dragging way of living, I'm not going to do that, these are your friends. This is the team that we now have for one another in spite of all that pain and loss around us. We are that team. We are the support system for each other when others tear us down. We are here to love each other when the world hates us. We're here to serve each other when the world shuns us. We're here to push each other to grow in our faith, to overcome the obstacles that we inevitably will face. We are the ones that rally around one another when this pressure comes. That's your team. That's your family. We are the family of God. There's one final scripture I want to close with just for a second. And typically, this is left for mainly pastors. It applies directly to ministers, and we'll talk about that for just a second. But this can also apply to any believer. And I I thought of this the entire time working through this passage, so I wanted to close with this. So later on in Paul's life, he's writing letters to Timothy, who's a young up-and-coming pastor. Probably at this time, he's pastoring in Ephesus, which Paul hasn't been to yet, but he'll get there. Um, Timothy, who's with him right now on this journey— He's writing to him later in 1 Timothy 4, 2 through 5. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Now, in context, this is written by Paul to a pastor in this vocation. So the immediate context here applies to ministers. So this would apply to me first, right? If you're reading this in the context in which it's written and shared and to be lived out. So I'm trying to do this, right? This is the goal. This is the aim. This is where we're trying to get to. We'll look at more of that even next week as we hit a new town in Acts later on in Acts 17. But also, this, these general principles can apply to any follower of Jesus, So I think what Paul would say to any follower of Jesus is live out your faith in good times and in bad times. When it's easy and when it sounds like a wedding right now, but that's why we're the bride of Christ, okay? This is is kind of the the vow. Uh, When it's easy, when it's not, when people accept you and when they reject you, which will be more times than we want to admit. People will not, he says people aren't going to want to hear the truth of the Bible anymore, and they certainly don't. We're way past that point right now. Like, we're way out there. Paul knew what he was talking about, clearly. But Paul would say, live your life of faith, keep a clear mind, and don't be afraid. 
because we have this team. Jesus is the king. He's in charge, but we have this team around us as well. Now, I will admit, this may be not the most encouraging message I've ever preached before, but I think it's still important. I think that's kind of the point. That's the whole point of here of this patch in Acts 17 is we want to live our life of faith, and if we're called troublemakers, so be it, right? If we're called treasonous, so be it. If we're accused of being on the wrong team, so be it. I'm, I've got, I'm on Jesus' team. That's all I care about, okay? So if we do this, if we are okay with making trouble, we're okay with Jesus being king, and we're on his team, then you and I can turn this world right side up. We can start to make some changes in the lives of some people and carry out the work that God has for us. You can carry out the work that God has for you, despite the pressure, despite those side eyes that you might get, despite the rejection that you might face on a daily basis. You can live out God's work for you and do exactly what he's called you to do, even under pressure. Let's pray today. God, I pray that you would encourage us with maybe a bit of a discouraging message today. Help us to see that you do want us to make trouble. You do want us to kind of shake things up a little bit. You want us to turn things from upside down to right side up. The way that you've called us to live is countercultural. It is treasonous to people that are apart from you. That we are serving a different king, and he is Jesus, and the culture doesn't get that, but we just have to be okay with that at times. We're accused of being on the wrong team, on the wrong side of this issue, the wrong side of history. Sometimes they'll say, I'm like, I'm on team Jesus, I'll be fine. You can reject me, you can, you know, you can call me this, and you can say that, and you can do whatever, but we're going to shake things up, we're going to serve our king, and we're going to do it as a team. God, we desire to live for you despite the pressure that maybe we're under right now, despite the threats that we might face even at our job, despite the veiled threats even to be cut off from family members or friends, there is going to be pressure. There is a price to pay. But help us to say, Jesus is my king, and I'm going to serve him, and I'm going to make trouble for him, and I'm going to do it with his team around me. Help us to live that kind of strong, vibrant, real, powerful faith and just see what happens when we shake things up. Just see who gets who, whose attention we get. Just see whose hearts and minds and lives that you change and transform because we're willing to be under that pressure. You will help us to live out the plan you've called for us to live. You will help us to do the work you've called us to do. Help us to be strong. Help us to remain faithful and faith-filled as we live out our faith each and every day. I pray you would bless us today as we leave this place. Give us a great week this week, full of faith, full of power, making trouble. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.